Hi everyone, um, good morning and uh, welcome to our webinar session on staying connected to your customers during COVID-19. So basically it's the first edition of um, a series of webinar that we'll be conducting to expose businesses on how to stay connected to their customers during this period, um, especially with the economic crisis, the lockdown and everything that's happening. Businesses are basically disconnected from their customers. Consumers are developing new purchase behaviors, new um, media consumption habits, and brands need to know how to stay connected to their customers during this period and um, how to reach out to them, give them the kind of products they want, the best channels to reach them and all that. So we'll be taking you through all that today and subsequently, and um, trying to unlock some of the winning ways for you to stay connected with your customers. My name is Vincent Asekame. I'm with the marketing team at Terragon. Um, for the purpose of this um, webinar, uh, uh, everyone here, your um, mics have been on mute by the hosts and your video too. However, we'll be sharing our screen and um, showing you what we are talking about as we progress. If you have questions, you can um, drop them at the, in the Q and A section of your screen, just top there you see Q and A um, button, so you can just drop your questions there. I would be inviting our hosts very quickly, but we just want to give maybe two minutes for more participants to join. So at 11:05, we would start by welcoming our hosts. Okay, so uh, our host for today is, as you have seen from the flyers, Tunde Adeniron. Tunde Adeniron is a VP product at Terragon. He's a well-established product management expert with over a decade's worth of experience building enterprise software and advanced analytics products to solve problems at scale. Tunde is very, experienced and um, well-learned in this field and he'll be taking us through today's session and the interactions with our panelists on how we can stay connected to um, our customers during this period of COVID-19. Over to you, Tunde. Thanks, um, Vincent. Um, good morning, everyone. I trust we are all keeping safe. Um, welcome once again to our webinar on staying connected to your customers during COVID-19. These are trying times for everyone and um, businesses are impacted. So it's our hope that um, you would get a few tips from this webinar that you could apply to your businesses um, to stay afloat and essentially continue to drive growth in the coming future. Um, before we get started, I'm just gonna quickly talk about Tarragon for a bit. Um, next slide. Yeah, so Tarragon basically is a 10-year-old business. Um, we enable supercharged connections between brands and consumers. Um, we are presently located in five countries um, across Africa. Um, and then we also have some presence in India, Bangalore and India, and um, the United Kingdom as well. We're very much focused on mobile and data and using technology to drive marketing outcomes for businesses within Africa. These are some of the businesses we've worked with over the past um, 10 years. We've worked with um, the top businesses across different verticals, the financial space, the fast moving consumer goods space. And um, because technology sits at the heart of our DNA, as well as data, 
we offer bespoke marketing technology solutions to the brands that we work with um, to drive business outcomes. Today, we are an enterprise marketing cloud and data analytics company um, using data to drive marketing outcomes for businesses across several verticals. Um, we are focused on delivering our proprietary solutions um, to offer these services. Um, data has become a very key part of marketing in today's world, right? The more data you have on individuals, the better you're able to target them, the better you're able to get them to essentially onboard onto your product, your service, the, the more you're able to personalize your experience and your interactions with them, which at the end of the day is the pinnacle of what we're gonna be discussing today. Um, at Terragon, we aggregate data across different sources, both online and offline, and we use this data to help drive intelligence for businesses such that you're able to achieve two things. One is you're able to solve safe costs by, by targeting intelligently, and you're also able to drive um, your business objectives more aggressively. Okay, so let's look at the impact of COVID-19 on Nigeria as a whole. Um, a number of us, I'm sure we are, we are familiar with um, some of the information here as it's been in the news. Um, crude oil prices have basically tanked. Um, and that has affected um, our annual budget for the year 2020. Um, revised budget estimates for crude oil production has gone down from 2.18 million barrels per day to 1.7 million barrels per day. Um, the crude oil price is below $30 at the moment. Um, because we now have limited foreign exchange earnings, um, the exchange rates um, has gone up um, to 360 officially. Black market is around 400, 410. It's estimated to continue to rise um, if the crude oil price doesn't come back up very quickly. Now, as a result of these things, um, the government has a very significant shortfall in revenues, projected revenues for the year 2020. Um, they had initially projected about 8.42 trillion naira to drive the annual budget, but uh, revenue estimates right now has come down to about 5 trillion naira. On the expenditure side, um, because our budget is largely recurrent in nature, about 70% of it goes to recurring expenses, salaries, and the likes. Um, it's, it's been a bit difficult to cut things down, but they've made a very small adjustment of about 300 billion to the annual budget, um, dropping it from 10.59 trillion to 10.27 trillion naira. Now, what you would find is with the 2020 budget, with the way things are going, um, the budget is largely going to be run as a deficit budget. You can see the size of the deficit has essentially almost tripled um, from 2.17 trillion to about 5.2 trillion naira. This means the government is going to be borrowing heavily from both domestic and international lenders. And of course, this puts additional pressure on future budgets and on our ability to service this um, future budgets. Now we're going to be looking at the impact of the COVID-19 on Nigerian businesses. Essentially, two things are happening at a very macro level. Um, we call them twin shocks. Um, first of all, you have the global pandemic, the COVID-19 global pandemic that is affecting um, supply and demand. And then you have the oil price war that essentially has then created a macroeconomic challenge for all dependent countries like Nigeria. Um, so if you take these two global issues, you would find out that across the different levels that businesses operate, there's a challenge one way or the other. On the supply side, businesses, uh, a lot of businesses are import dependent. So businesses import raw materials, for example, from China, from Asia, from Europe, and other parts of the world. Um, importing goods right now has two challenges. One, they're going to import those goods um, at a more expensive price because of the exchange rate um, fluctuations. Um, and two, due to the lockdowns and issues around mobility right now, um, getting your goods in a timely manner is also a problem. On the demand side, aggregate demand across the economy has, has dropped, right? Um, there's been some job losses in a number of um, um, industry verticals. You have a number of people who are not able to work. You have businesses who are folding up. Um, and these things are generally having an impact on demand as a whole. Um, on the financial side, it's going to become tougher for businesses to get access to credits um, due to several things um, on the macroeconomic side, namely um, foreign portfolio investors are not 
really come into Nigeria uh, as much as they used to. Um, everyone is trying to stay safe right now. Um, the government is also trying to stay safe. Um, so liquidity, they are curbing liquidity to essentially put a, a sort of foothold on inflationary pressure in the economy. Um, so liquidity within the ecosystem is going to be a bit tough. It's going to be a bit more difficult for, for businesses to get um, loans from financial institutions. Um, and I, we expect that those banks would uh, begin to apply more scrutiny to individuals um, and businesses that they give loans to, to reduce um, the default rates. Next slide. So essentially, these, these are the macroeconomic um, shocks that we expect um, over the next couple of months. Some of them are already happening, um, while others would begin to feel the impact once um, we move away from the health crisis. Um, from what, what we've been studying, we're still in the health crisis phase. Uh, once this is done, um, we will then move into the economic crisis phase, right? So some of these things would happen over the uh, next couple of months. Um, now, from all we've seen so far, it, it's, it's essentially a tough time for businesses out there. Um, and then it means that there needs to be a different change in approach, a different change in uh, tactics, if you would like to say, um, for businesses, especially with how you interact with your customers. You know, a number of businesses, a number of individuals um, are not able to go out anymore. So, for example, if I take uh, myself and my personal experience, um, um, I don't buy physical recharge cards anymore, but a huge number of individuals still do. Um, due to the issues around mobility and the lockdowns, um, people would draw more affinity towards digital banking channels, for example. It then means that businesses need to have a different, a new digital touch points through which they can interact with their customers. You know, because you can't expect uh, footfall traffic anymore or as much as you used to. Restaurants, for example, are not able to accept people coming in. They can only serve takeouts. And several other businesses are impacted. Now, these are some of the things that we would be discussing today. What are those touch points that you could leverage on to interact with your customers at scale? Um, and I would like for you guys to also ask questions. This is an interactive session. If you have any questions, um, if you joined us late, I didn't hear my colleague Vincent explain initially. You could just ask your questions in the Q&A session. From time to time, we would go over um, to the Q&A box to read out your questions. Um, and then I would either answer them or ask one of the panelists to answer them. So essentially, there's been an increase in emphasis on digital platforms across all industry verticals, right? Um, so leveraging on social media, leveraging on um, digital marketing channels like SMS, like WhatsApp, to so web banners. Um, if you didn't have a website before, now is the best time to build a website and start gaining some search engine optimization traffic, some organic traffic. Um, and the panelists that we have today would be sharing um, some of their personal experiences around how, as businesses, we can better leverage digital platforms. But these are some of the, the few here. Uh, we have two panelists today. Um, Ayode Akin Femiwa is an agency business manager with Google. He's very well experienced. Um, he's worked with some of the largest advertising agencies in Africa, and he's an expert in digital marketing, digital technology, um, marketing challenges, and digital transformation as well. Um, we also have Dotun Ayongbile. Dotun Ayongbile works with Tarragon. He's the head of the customer success and ad operations team. He leads um, the both teams essentially to drive business outcomes for brands that Tarragon works with. Um, welcome, Ayode. Welcome, Dotun. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you for having us. Loud and clear, Sunday. Thank you for having us. Fantastic. Um, so the questions have started coming in. Um, thank you, guys. I would also like for you to give us a sense of the company you work with um, as you ask your questions so that we can, or so that rather our panelists can put it in context as they are answering your question. Um, so we have a number of questions that have come in before this webinar. We're just going to quickly run through them. Um, so first question, Ayode, um, what's your take? Are there any businesses you know of that are thriving despite the lockdown? Um, what are those things that you see that they are doing well that other businesses can emulate? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, and hi, everyone. 
Um, so uh, there are businesses that are thriving despite the lockdown. Um, in my experience in Nigeria, the lockdown and the subsequent impact has come more or less as a shock to most businesses uh, and very few businesses you know have the you know the wherewithal to um you know handle the shocks in the, in the short term what you'll find is that even e-commerce companies which should probably be in a better position are struggling um only because they rely on traditional supply chain um, to fulfill their services so to a large extent uh, the disruption has come to many businesses as a shock and uh, everyone is trying to adjust to the new normal um, however, there are some ideas around um, what industries would thrive during this period and what industries will have a harder time. Um, and, you know, a lot of that depends on the cash position of the business, the competitive position of the business, and the industry attractiveness. Um, so, for instance, you'd find that companies that depend a lot on physical gathering and physical interactions uh, without a lot of digital um, you know, channels to this would have a very hard time. Um, if you think about the likes of the travel and tourism industries, the likes of um, restaurants, um, theaters and cinemas, uh, those kind of companies would have a very hard time during this period. Uh, while companies that are able to deliver their solutions and services via digital channel, uh, while they would also have a hard time because consumers are being disrupted themselves, uh, would um, navigate this period relatively easier. So it's hard at this point to say which industries or which businesses you know, are succeeding only because the very consumers they are targeting are being disrupted themselves, right? Um, so perhaps in the short to long term, we'd see winners out of this period, uh, but in the short term, um, it's really difficult to see. Okay, um, thank you for that um, answer, Ayode. Uh, my next question goes to Dotun. Um, it's a bit of, of a twist on the earlier question. So Dotun, what verticals would you say are best positioned to take advantage of the current trend of digitized customer engagement? Digital customer engagement is a, is a, is a buzzword almost these days. Um, essentially, how do businesses interact with their customers and engage with their customers through digital channels, essentially? Thank you, Tunde, for the question. Um, I think it's a really interesting one, just to leverage some of the stuff that I already mentioned. Um, first, I believe e-commerce is, is in a cold, cold position to take advantage of this current trend. But like I already mentioned, they are heavily dependent on certain traditional uh, supply chain uh, um, methods. So that, that um, industry, for one has to disrupt itself. That industry for one has to disrupt itself to become um, an enabler to others. And when I mention it being an enabler to others, um, you think in terms of the FMCGs, think in terms of the SMEs, right? Who um, rely solely on direct to consumer relationships, right? Um, to that monetize their, their products. Um, if you look at this current trend, of course, we know um, there's a, there is every reason for growth on, on cashless transactions right now, right? Seeing how we are currently on a lockdown, seeing how the lockdown might be extended. And even if it, if, even if it doesn't get to... Um, a time period where some, some of us who are pessimistic, right, are thinking, we know that the, the average um, way of working is going to change, right? This, this disruption is yet to stay. We're not going back to what it was before. There is going to be a new normal. So if you look at um, um, the verticals that are best positioned, of course, those who promote cashless transactions, the, the, the banks, the fintechs, the telcos, and basically everybody that runs a digital service that um, enables the consumer to, to buy cashlessly. Um, also, um, one of the verticals I'll say is also best positioned to take advantage of this is um, the MOOCs, right? The Massive Online Learning uh, Course Platforms. 
who at this moment are servicing uh, uh, the youth populace, um, students who are out of school, couples whose um, responsibilities are taking a pause for now, and who are still very much eager to, um, to leverage this period for skill acquisition. Right, so you have all all the all the usual suspects, um, edX, Udemy, etc. Right, there's been a bit of a surge on their on their end for demand, um, and of course, digital services like the 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 one we're using right now, right, while while having this webinar through Zoom. So every communications uh, company right now is in pole position to to take full advantage from those who are enabling our conferencing to the telcos themselves who enable our mobile subscriptions, right? They're in full position to take um, full advantage of this digitized uh, customer engagement. The, um, on the FSI side, uh, minus the banks who we already know, um, we already have a very fair idea of what they can offer. We also know that certain industries who might have struggled in the past, for example, the health insurance industry, who's, who've been trying to drive retail, um, drive uptake on their retail side. Um, also companies who've been trying to drive uptake on their savings and investment plans, right? Now is the time to um, leverage where people's attention is in this period, right? Um, there's health consciousness going on right now. Like Tunde said, we're in the health consciousness phase, we will move to um, the economic effect phase um, after this. So retail health insurance could also be one that uh, uh, the market can bite right now. So um, there are a number of other industries, but I think these guys take the cake when it comes to leveraging this period for uh, um, latching onto this trend of digitized customer engagement. Fantastic. Um, thank you for that um, response, Dotun. Um, very interesting answer. Um, just to recap, the e-commerce vertical, um, the MOOCs, um, people like um, Coursera and the likes who do um, digital learning, um, digital services and communications. Um, just as you were talking, I, I saw a comment from one of the attendees, Habib Odetola, and he says, I believe the telecom industry is the most favored during this lockdown. Um, Habib from Ipsos, thank you for that um, feedback. Um, you also mentioned digital banks and health insurance. So essentially, companies that um, have a digital lens, right, um, are in a very good position. Thank you for that answer, Dotun. So my next question goes to Ayode. Um, and this question is, why is it critical for businesses to stay, for businesses to stay connected to their customers during the COVID-19 period or crisis? Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so that's a very good question. And to understand it, I think uh, first we need to, you know, take a step back and look at what's going on in the world. Uh, very clearly, uh, we're experiencing a perhaps a once a century uh, phenomena, um, probably comparable to the World War, um, you know, and it's disrupting lives, communities, businesses like never before. Uh, what you'll find now is that we, we're in a period of high anxiety and um, high uncertainty. You know, it's what economists would call VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So um, if you think about the average consumer, right now, um, they have three main priorities and three main needs um, that they are focused on. The first is uh, their immediate health and safety, not just for themselves, but they're for, their, for their families, right? Um, the second is sustenance needs, right? How do I survive? How do I stay, you know, how do I ensure that I have the things I need um, during the lockdown? Again, not just for myself, but for my family, um, you know, and the third is the economic well-being post the lockdown, right? Uh, do I still have a business? Do I still have a job? You know, how do I, you know, adjust for the disruptions that I've experienced during the lockdown, right? So those three things are, you know, what's top of mind for most consumers. Um, and again, you can put yourself in the shoes of most consumers and very likely you're thinking about one of the three things. Um, the next, you know, and, and again, this might remind you of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, going back to basic safety needs, to psychological, you know, and up and up. Right now, for most people, we're down to the very first um, level of the pyramid. 
Um, the next is to understand that there's a dynamic reprioritization going on for most consumers. In fact, you know, at this time, I like to refer to for all of us because we're also consumers ourselves, right? Um, and what you'd find is that um, there's, you know, for most of us, we're building new relationships to time and space, right? Time has expanded while space has contracted. We have, you know, more time uh, because we're stuck in one location, you know, and our space has sort of like contracted. Uh, second is that we're building new relationships with ourselves and with others. You know, and while most of the world is social distancing at this moment, we are focused more inwardly. You know, we're trying to connect more emotionally. People are reaching out. People are trying to build deeper and stronger bonds. Our third is that we're building new relationships to our work and our leisure, right? The normal routine of day and weeks and time is changing and giving way to long duration of, you know, the same thing. You know, <laughs> you know I, I talk to my friends and, you know, people say, I don't even know what day of the week it is anymore, right? Um, and lastly, we're, we're building new relationships with our consumption and our expenditure. Um, clearly, uh, there's an economic recession coming up. You know, it's forecasted that Sub-Saharan Africa is going to experience its first economic recession in 25 years. Uh, and globally, um, it's projected that the, the downturn is going to be worse than the Great um, Depression. And we can already see signals of that with a huge un unemployment rate in the U.S., Right. So amidst the economic uncertainty and scarcity, people are proceeding with caution and focusing on their more immediate psychological and material concerns. Right. Uh, not not so much projecting an outward image, but more, you know, fulfilling my immediate needs. Right. So you need to understand all of this different reprioritization that is going on for most consumers. Um, and in times like this, consumers are not necessarily thinking about a brand or a business. You know, they are thinking about those their key needs that need to be fulfilled. Um, and if brands can lead and start with empathy, right, and understand the mindset, the, the needs of consumers at this moment, um, you know, then they can build stronger bonds with them over the long term. So in this period that is really uncertain, very volatile, um, brands and businesses need to, you know, stay really connected as much as possible to their consumers and their customers. Uh, you wanna ensure that you're filling their pulse at every point in time. And you want to ensure that you are, you are in touch with them such so that you can anticipate the needs, the behavioral changes, uh, what people are saying, and you can step in and, you know, fulfill the needs where you have a right to speak. So, you know, it's really critical to stay connected to consumers only because so many changes are happening, so many disruptions is going on. The future, the immediate future is uncertain, um, and you want to protect your business. Um, you want your consumers to feel like this brand is not just all about selling to me, but is, is, is with me in these difficult times, in these trying periods. So, you know, that's just one of several reasons why I need to stay connected to consumers during this period. Great. Um, thanks for that response, Ayode. Um, very, very well answered. Um, as a follow-up, um, so I, I, I and, and this is a personal question from me. Um, it, it's very common to hear people say, um, "Out of sight is out of mind," right? Um, for personal relationships, say myself and my friends and and, and those ones around me. Would you say it, it also applies to the interactions between consumers and brands, right? Out of sight is out of mind. Would you say that that also applies? And is that a reason why? brands should continually engage um, with customers during this period, especially when you look at the challenges around mobility. Um, so if, for example, I used to see a brand, um, interact with a brand via a billboard or a radio ad, I may not necessarily have such interactions as much as I used to anymore. Um, so do you see that also affecting the relationships or the strength of the relationships between consumers and brands generally? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, in this moment, people are not thinking so much about brands. I'm thinking about my own well-being. I'm thinking about my family. I'm thinking about my security, my safety, um, ensuring that I have what I need. Um, Brand Sharp, the author of How Brands Grow, um, talks about the two mental models that drives um, consumer purchase. And the first is mental availability. Um, are your consumers thinking about you, especially at the point of purchase, at the point of decision making, and physical avail availability? Are you available at the point of purchase such that consumers who might not necessarily be thinking about you can easily access your product and buy from you? 
In this time and season, those two mental models are being significantly challenged because my men mentally, I'm thinking about several other things. I'm not necessarily thinking about the best kicks to buy, you know, for the summer or the best phones or the best clothes to buy, right? I'm thinking about how I can make sure that I have enough uh, to take care of myself. I'm thinking about how, you know, I can ensure that my business and my source of livelihood is going well. I'm thinking about how to make sure that, you know, if I have any health needs, not necessarily COVID-19, right? There are other health needs that people have. I'm in a good position to, to take care and respond, right? So indeed, um, in this moment, uh, you know, it's very easy for the consumer, the average consumer, to forget about brands and forget about businesses, which means that brands and businesses need to work a lot harder to stay, um, you know, in the mental, you know, um, to stay top of mind for consumers. Um, and you cannot stay top of mind by just trying to sell, sell, sell during this period. You need to connect on an emotional basis. Um, you need to fulfill any of the critical needs. Uh, you need to, you know, people again, uh, you know, trying to stay entertained, trying to, you know, not get too into the isolation. They're trying to connect with other people. So as brands, you need to facilitate some of those needs, right? Um, and so, yes, it's very easy for consumers to forget about brands. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned earlier, brands need to, you know, really dial up their empathy during this period. Um, and that's the only way, you know, you can stay connected. You know, a lot of brands are going to reap, you know, rewards from this season uh, because now they can tap into their CSR and, and the human side of the business. Um, but, you know, brands that don't really dial up those attributes would, you know, see consumers move on to other businesses and other brands. All right. Um, thanks, Ayode. Thank you so much for that response. Um, so we have a number of questions from attendees. Um, I would like you guys to keep the questions flowing um, so that we can follow a certain order. What um, I would like us to do is uh, we have about uh, four more questions to go on the slides. Um, so we'll go through these questions very quickly with our panelists, and then I'll begin to read out uh, the questions from the attendees. So let's keep the question flowing, guys. So the next question um, goes to Dotsun. What are the most effective customer engagement channels for businesses that are cost conscious? Most businesses right now are looking to cut costs, right? So what are those um, engagement channels that they can continue to leverage in spite of cutting costs? Yeah, thanks Tunde for that question. Um, I mean, like you already said, everyone is trying to cut costs right now. I don't know a single business who's not, who's not um, about that right now. When you look at the, the most abundant demographic in Nigeria, that's um, people between the ages 20 to 35 and their choice of channels for accessing the contents they access daily, right? I mean, you'd see um, the usual suspects, social media, WhatsApp, WhatsApp, which is responsible for lots of information spread and lots of misinformation spread as well. Um, you see a lot of folks on there. You see them also um, visiting blogs and, and um, sites and um, getting updates from the apps they use on their phone as well, right? So these are definitely useful channels to reach um, these customers for um, digital engagements. But when you also look further at how much of the um, how much of the this population is represented on on online media? You will see that it's less than fifty percent. We have over fifty percent of the mobile subscribers in Nigeria still predominantly offline, right? These are people that probably consume less than a hundred MB um, in a month, right? So their internet usage is very limited. In fact. Um, most of these populists I just mentioned, most of this dem demographic I, I just mentioned, um, uh, WhatsApp is more or less the limit of their social media, right? So, of, of course, you have to be able to leverage um, offline channels such as SMS, USSD, um, and even better when the SMS and USSD also have the option to be interactive, right? That's a two for one. It means you can get um, customer interactions that give you a response, help you feel the pulse of their, their, um, their needs, their preferences in this period, 
right? I already just walked us through how customer preferences can easily change in this period because of all the uncertainties every business is facing. And of course, customers aren't thinking of each business as a business. What they are thinking of is the service, right? What kind of, what's the quality of service I'm getting right now? What's the relevance of the service I'm getting right now? We li I like to think of um, our economy in terms of what exactly is every brand competing with? Every brand is competing with certain basics, right? Essentials, as our government has called them now. Food, housing, need to see power supply, it's to see. You see that some of the industries that are also even thriving in this period, the agriculture industry that, that are providing food to our markets, the power industry, of course, is still an essential one, right? Um, the um, fuel industry, although we know what, how, how um, crude oil prices globally have affected that. But when you look at um, where attention is right now, for the average consumer. The average consumer is thinking of these things. So the last thing they want to think of is um, um, jumping on a service that isn't gonna add to their convenience. Right now, what, what every brand needs to focus on selling is convenience. And that convenience is gonna come from um, being able to access a channel or being, a, being able to, to, to communicate with your brand or being able to um, feel like your brand is still connected to you through whatever channel is most comfortable for you. If you are predominantly offline, you want your brand to still be able to reach you via SMS, via USSD, giving you all the relevant information, meeting you at the, the points of your need. You want your brand to be able to even predict your needs currently. Um, I mean, the, the, your brand should know what, um, what the country is clamoring for, what the average consumer is clamoring for, and your brand should be able to uh, position that offer to you right, via the channels that you are predominantly on. Um, as we know, out of whom channels are very relevant during a lockdown, but I'm sure you didn't even need me to mention that. So of course, these digital channels are the most effective channels for any business that is, number one, looking to leverage this period, and of course, looking to be cost conscious. Because now you have very, you, ha you, are, you are running your marketing through channels where engagement is most measurable. Right, um, these channels en enable you measure the customer engagement, measure um, and uh, measure how well you're able to predict your customer's propensity towards an offer or not, and it, it helps you better position your brand to help them. Like I said, think of what we are competing with in the customer's life. In the customer's life, you are currently competing with essentials. So think of how you need you position yourself as an essential through every channel possible, leveraging the offline channels, SMS and USSD, and leveraging the online channels, all your ad networks, the programmatic social media, um, the mobile sites and apps, and of course, like I said, um, WhatsApp uh, as a means to effectively engage these customers repeatedly and cost-effectively. Okay, um, thank you for that very robust answer, Dotun. Um, I, I'd actually pen down a follow-up question for you, but you had answered it as you continued talking. Um, thank you so much once again. Oh, um, so my next question goes to Ayode. Um, and the question goes thus, what are the quick wins or low-hanging fruits that um, CEOs, marketers can ride on um, to stay in touch with their customers this period? Okay, uh, so f um, during this period, uh, one of the best things to do is to look at the data um, and try to draw from the insights uh, based on the new behavior, uh, the new reprioritization, um, and then you know capitalize on that, uh, not in a destructive way. Uh, you don't want to be unnecessarily opportunistic um, during this period. Uh, but rather feel the need that consumers are having. Uh, so for instance, from our end at Google, uh, we're seeing a significant, in, I mean, we're seeing an, a significant increase across board um, only because we are a digital business, uh, but um, especially if you find in, um, in digital media uh, on YouTube, for instance, we're seeing a significant increase in consumption. Um, you know, we've added, you know, several million new users um, in the last three to four weeks, 
um, you know, I sent an email to my, uh, my client last week of how, you know, for the first time, YouTube is now um, over 20 million um, in Nigeria, uh, you know, and, and that was Facebook a few years ago. Um, you know, so a lot of people are coming online to consume, to get entertained, to stay informed. Um, and for most businesses, it makes sense to deploy all the data communication tools you have at your disposal, right? From teleconferencing like we're having today, to your blogs, uh, to your social, to your video, to your e email, etc. Um, because people would be exposed to so much information this period, you probably want to think about how you can make your content bite-sized. Uh, you know, so not so much long form content, but short snap, um, snackable content. Um, you want to, you know, offer entertainment and fun. You want to offer information and education. You want to offer health um, and safety related content. You want to offer the occasional distractions um, and hopeful content, right? Um, I've seen brands talk about, you know, what you're going to do after the isolation is over, right? And, and people can get dreamy and all of that, right? Uh, and, and it's a way to just have a quick getaway from the current boredom uh, and, and all of that, right? So those are some opportunities. Um, personally, I think more than ever before, and again, depending on the size of business, right? Uh, this period is a great time to actually build one-on-one, -on -one, if possible, relationships with your consumers, right? So um, I'm seeing small business and startups actually reach out to, to their consumers now and have, you know, you know afternoon coffee, Friday chats, uh, you know, digital launch and all of those kind of things, right? Uh, you know, there'll be opportunities, you know, to, to have those kind of conversations. And these are things that you might not have, um, you know, after this isolation is, lock, is, is over because now people have so much time um, on their hands and, you know, people are trying to find how to fill that time, uh, you know, so, you know, pause, check your consumers, um, talk to them, have a quick phone call, a short survey to understand what's top of mind and, you know, create um, um, content, you know, during this period, you don't necessarily want to be perfect and, you know, well produced, um, well branded and all of that, but rather you want to be relevant. You want to, you want to be, um, you want to seem relatable, right? Um, you know, so I think more than any period in time, brands can be very human um, in, in this period. And that in itself is a great strategy for building connections with your consumers. Thank you, Ayede. Um, it's very interesting to note that we now have over 20 million Nigerians on YouTube. Um, that's a very interesting statistic. So it means that more brands can begin to leverage um, YouTube as, as a channel and essentially unlock um, video as a channel for um, online or digital marketing, as you'd say. Um, I also like your point around building one-on-one -on -one interactions with um, consumers. I, th I think that's a very strong point. Um, just to add to what you've said, um, I, I also think that there's an opportunity for brands this period to latch on to um, some of these things that we are seeing on, on social media, some of these challenges. Um, you have a lot of them, the Don't Rush Challenge, Bob Daddy Challenge. It's very interesting. I, I'm not sure I've seen any brand latch on to one of these things, but I, I think it's very interesting to see how brands can be creative um, to latch on to the moment um, and then, of course, get um, latch into the excitement and fun of the moment while people are home. Okay, um, my next question goes to Dr. Right, um, so this is question six now. Right, so Dr. Do you, do you see the pandemic having an impact on how businesses interact with their customers going into the future? Oh yes, definitely. Um, I think a number of things we've seen now will become the new normal because that's just how human psychology works. Um, so digital transfers, um, online shopping, bill payments, airtime top up um, will all be, there'll be a higher uptake or retention rather. There's already that uptake building now. There'll be higher retention even beyond the pandemic on this, um, on this cashless channels. Also, um, to leverage what both you and Ayodhya already said, um, direct relationships with customers will be more, um, more value will be placed on it. I think consumer behavior will shift towards direct to, uh, to consumer engagement, 
right? Um, the businesses who are being who are positioning themselves as direct to consumer businesses right now will be long term winners. Um, I think also if you look at the e commerce um, vertical, right? Um, I think grocery shopping. I mean, every every we don't know when the next one will be announced, but um, we know before every lockdown, we are told to you know take one day off, go do all your grocery shopping so you can stock up for the lockdown period, right? Um, I think cashless grocery shopping, which is already an emerging e-commerce category, would also see a surge after this. What we see on e-commerce mostly as of today is um, home appliances, um, maybe personal. Uh, um, appliances as well, you know, um, there are very usual suspects that we see when it comes to e-commerce sales, but I think cashless grocery, grocery shopping, um, which is already an emerging category, will, will continue to um, have its time in the sunlight. Um, I think um, customers will become used to that direct access to the brand and the level of personalization, which gives them assurances and prevents them from migrating. Because one of the key things in this period that this uncertainty is gonna cause is um, customer migration is gonna happen in mass across different brands. There's gonna be a lot of customer migration um, across different competitors. So uh, the level of personalization a brand is able to establish right now um, will become cultural even beyond the pandemic. And that same level of personalization will continue to um, be relevant. Um, also, uh, something funny I noticed, right? Um, this is very random, but we we are also moving to. I think we'll see a shift towards um, a subscription economy. Now, when I say subscription subscription economy, um, it's a term that was coined up when when we saw the surge of um, the world moving from movie rental stores to Netflix and co, from record stores to music streaming platforms. You know, all the services that claimed ah, tech has come to kill us. Tech didn't actually come to kill them. The tech just introduced disruption that enabled people to move more towards uh, subscription-based services. So I think once again, we're going to move towards the subscription economy. I think the subscription economy 2.0 for us. Um, um, more businesses, more, more, more consumers will enjoy the... Um, convenience of being able to subscribe to a service and see it um, just automatically give them that service without having to follow up with the brand again and again and again and again. If any following up should be done, it should be the brand following up with the customer to verify their satisfaction, etc. etc. So I think um, the pandemic definitely has already shown an impact on how businesses interact with their consumers. Um, with, like I said before, out of whom doesn't have relevance right now. So digital channels are uh, for the win. Um, but also on those digital channels, the level of personalization each brand is able to establish, the level of automation each brand is able to give their customers when it comes to accessing services, which speaks to the subscription economy point I made, I think will, um, I think it's something that's gonna stick with us going into the future. Um, We've seen certain effects of different um, world changes, different pandemics in the past, different recessions, and how they changed the perception of the world. I think that uh, work from home, a lot of businesses will um, seek to leverage work from home a bit more because um, they, it will help them continue to optimize cost. Um, and if that continues, it also means that the video conferencing businesses, the internet, service providing businesses, the telcos, and all of us enablers behind these guys, um, we, will be, we will continue to be taxed with maintaining that uh, level of satisfaction we have built with the customer during this period. Thanks, Dotson. Um, I particularly like your, your response around um, grocery shopping and um, cashless grocery shopping is going to gain prominence. Uh, brands need to leverage on um, digital channels uh, to drive personalization and, and, and so on. Um, my follow-up question um, for you, Dotson, is this. Um, right now, at least in Nigeria, the traditional or the average marketer um, still allocates more of his budget to 
out of home channels like billboards, for example. Um, of course, with the lockdowns, those channels are no longer relevant as yourself and Ayode have mentioned. Um, so right now there's gonna be um, a bit more emphasis on digital channels and, and digital spending, right? Driving marketing objectives through these digital channels. Um, do you see it remaining that way um, going forward, even after this uh, crisis? Yes, I think there's a there's a there's a sixty forty chance there, right? Of it uh, remaining like this. Um, of course, the out the out of home industry isn't gonna pack up um, after the pandemic. There will be, um, of course, some sort of resurgence. But what would be important to note is the convenience that the consumer is already used to from being engaged via um, digital channels. Is already here to stay. I think that the attention that hasn't been paid to digital engagements before um, that is being paid now will open more eyes for um, brand marketers to, to, to allocate their budgets more, a little more intelligently, right? Um, right now that this is a cut costing period for everybody else, well, everybody wants to be able to measure the effect of their engagement. Um, are we, how, how quickly are we moving customers through our acquisition funnel, how, um, how, how well are we able to stay on the customer's mind, etc. Those things are way more measurable with, uh, through digital engagements than what you have from out of home. So I think that, um, and this is something, this is a point um, we at Terragon, for example, have been trying to make for, for um, the longest time now, the, the relevance of being able to measure your marketing metrics and what it does for you in the long run, being able to draw a straight line from your marketing efforts to your return on investment. I think that recognition um, is going to play a big role going forward. So I'd say there's a, in fact, I'd, I'd go on a limb and say there's a 70, 30 chance that um, it continues as is um, while um, there's a return to out of home. I think that um, a large chunk of what was previously allocated to out, out of home will now be, um, leveraged on digital channels. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Dotun. Um, so thanks, Ayode. Thanks, Dotun. Um, I have one more bonus question, but just before I go there, we have about um, six um, or seven questions from our attendees. So I'm just very quickly going to read out um, them one after the other. Um, you guys are free to take up um, any of the questions. Um, so if you just like to take it up, just let me know. Um, and just go straight to answering them. Um, so the first question is, I'm trying to use the timestamp so that I'm, I'm as fair as possible. Um, okay, first two questions came at the same time, 11.16. Okay, so I'm going to take the question from Omotola Shotade first. Um, she works in insurance. Um, and her question is, do you think companies should reset revenue budget for 2020 to manage expectations due to the current crisis? Yes, so um, I can take a quick stab at that. Um, I think um, there should definitely be um, um, reviews, but I don't think it's, it's um, I don't think we should reset. I think what we should do is this. Um, every business right now has to evaluate what the rest of the year looks like for them. Um, the budgets that have been planned for this period have already been planned for this period. What we need to do now is think of the most effective channels to spend those budgets on. Um, to, uh, um, and, and now, if we're talking about revenue budgets, which, which is what this speaks to, uh, like I said, there has to be revisions. Um, I don't think that um, a total reset will be necessary. But whether it is our revenue budget or our spending or our, uh, our cost budget, um, I think we need to revise it in line with um, the times. What I think needs to change is the projections we've made for future periods. Um, this period is we're already in this period, right? We need to just make sure that whatever we do um, is being done in the most intelligent way possible. Um, there is no more excuse for um, working with channels that don't necessarily give you um, measurable outcomes. Um, there is no more excuse for working with um, uh, um, 
methods or, 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 or ways of working that give you uncertainties. Now you want to have certainties. You want to you want, you want everything to be as measurable as possible, right? Um, so right now, the budgets for this period um, should definitely stay as is. And what we should be seeking to do is leveraging um, the opportunities. This in every disaster, the opportunities, the opportunities that this disaster ha has presented to us, and um, um, see how we make the most of it. And of course, revise whatever we have planned for the, the next set of quarters. Um, as far as revenue budget goes, yeah, of course, you can also revise what you have planned for, for um, the remaining quarters. Um, there's a lot of ascendancy right now, like I already has reiterated a couple of times. So we should, um, rather than just make a flat line projection of, oh yeah, by Q3, this will be this and this will be that. What we need to do is apply that sense of Measure, measurements, right? Every week we need to have, um, we need to come up with action points that take us into the next week with us putting the best foot forward. So it's something that right now you need to measure as closely as possible um, on a day by day basis, on a week by week basis to understand what you need to revise um, when it comes to your budgets. Okay, thank you for that um, answer, Dr. Um, so the next question is from Eve Roy. Um, he didn't put his, he or she didn't put their vertical here or where they work. But the question is, I guess they work in the financial space because this is related to um, that sector. How do we tackle the issue of high fraud occurrences, especially in the financial sector, due to the availability of sensitive people's of sensitive data in people's so I guess the question is, how do we tackle the issue of high fraud occurrences, especially in the financial sector, due to the unavailability of sensitive data on people's homes? Yeah, I've just tried to, yeah. Who's going to take that question for us? Um, I can attempt. So okay. um, in this period, I think uh, obviously uh, while there's a lot of online consumption and interaction, um, there's a big need for security and privacy. Um, I think this applies in several ways. First, as businesses, depending on the industry and the uh, data sensitivity, um, I think all businesses should be, uh, you know, sort of reminding and advising their customers on, you know, basic best practices as regards security, privacy, um, online safety, etc. Right. So, you know, um, constantly remind your consumers on, you know. You know, ensuring that you you know you're not an easy target for hackers and um, you know people who might be looking for loopholes um, during this period. I think for most businesses as well, uh, perhaps this season, um, again depending on the sensitivity of, of your industry, um, perhaps this season is not where you want to experiment with um, platforms that you know are not trusted that you haven't used in the past, um, especially for you know um, sensitive information. Right, so you know, go back to the more established platforms, um, the ones that have a good track record and reputation for security and privacy, and work with those. And if you must experiment, then ensure that it's very, very controlled. Right, I wouldn't put the database of you know tens of thousands of consumers on a cloud platform that I've never used before, right, or on a startup cloud platform that you know has no track record of safety and privacy and all whatnot. So. Um, you know, at this time, you don't want to take unnecessary risk. Um, go to where you know is established, is safe, has a good track record. Start with those, and over time, you can you know pick other um, platforms that you you'd rather experiment with. So um, I think also um, there's a responsibility of brands to educate their consumers to put more protection in place for their consumers um, and ensure that you know they have a um, a safe um, interaction online. Okay, thanks, um, Ayode. Uh, next question is from Kingsley Iweka. Um, with digital engagement and connections surging at the moment, do you imagine there will be such a thing as digital satiation or saturation? Essentially, what do you imagine people could get tired of digitally, depending on how long this pandemic takes to be contained? This is, this is a very interesting question, I must say. Who would like to take a stab at this? 
um, <clears throat> I, I can go again. Uh, so I, I think what we have seen is an acceleration of everything, right? Um, and digital saturation is just one of several accelerations that we would see. Um, I like the comment by Professor Scott Galloway, um, and he says that things won't change as much as they will accelerate. While other crises will shape the future, COVID-19 is going to make the future happen even faster. So um, a few years ago, most of the tech companies, the OEMs, had started focusing on digital well-being, you know, reducing the time spent on our screens, being able to track the time spent on platforms, etc. Um, already, consumers and you know, se sets of people are um, taking time off of the internet and of social and all of these other platforms just to gain regain your sanity because it's so much information, you know, it 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 it's, it can get so much at some point. So you're having people now, you know, enforcing time off the internet. I personally um, have started to use the focus feature in Android a lot more. So now, you know, for hours of the day, um, I put my phone on airplane mode and just turn off my, turn on my Wi-Fi. And then even on my Wi-Fi, I put, I go to the focus mode just to ensure that I can control the amount of information I'm being exposed to. Um, and again, it's not so much a new trend um, because it's been there. Um, but it's only going to be accelerated during this period, right? People are now more conscious of it. The features and the, solution, the options to opt out are available. So yes, we, I think it's something that, you know, was already there. It's going to be more accelerated this period. Um, again, I think the responsible thing for brands to do is actually to advise their consumers on how to maintain their mental well-being during this period. And one of such ways is to... Um, find out time to disconnect, right? Even as brands, perhaps you want to limit the amount of information you're sending to your consumers, right? If you've been sending three emails per day, right? Maybe you want to cut it down to one email and explain why, you know, we care about your well-being, your mental, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's why we're reducing our communication, right? Or give people the option to opt in and opt out, right? Um, only because it's the right thing to do. Um, and it, it, it's what consumers are going to do anyways. Okay, thank you, Ayode. Next question is from Adim Isiakona. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, forgive me if I did not. The question goes thus, with the pandemic, the plummeting oil prices and its impacts on our economy, how can traditional business stay profitable by leveraging digital without incurring incremental infrastructure costs? Hmm, this is an interesting question. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so or, already, in fact, the, the, the question, um, the tail end of the question um, has a bit of its answer in there, right? Um, how can traditional businesses stay profitable by leveraging digital without incurring incremental infrastructure costs? The beauty of digital already starts by um, um, positioning the, the, the whatever business is leveraging digital to save a lot of infrastructure costs, right? Um, I mentioned um, what kind of habits are gonna stick with us um, beyond the pandemic. I mentioned the, the culture that we've derived from this pandemic staying with us. Um, um, and even businesses that have seen the effects of work from home, they would also um, switch up their current uh, uh, working structure to, to include more of this work from home to save infrastructure costs. That's the beauty of digital in a nutshell. So how can businesses stay profitable by, by leveraging digital? Um, we've mentioned the number of digital channels. Um, it would have been good to see um, examples of what current traditional channels your business adding um, uses, um, which are cost centers for you. Um, it would have been good to see that so that I can directly tackle what each of these costs, uh, 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 how you can shed off some of these cost centers and, and leverage its counterparts on the digital side. But I'll just use some, some general examples. Um, I've used the first one of uh, office infrastructure costs. Um, also, the, when it comes to the way you do your current marketing, the way you do your current marketing, um, if it's through traditional means, then there's definitely a lot of um, um, logistic uh, cost involved. There's definitely a lot of um, top of mind awareness cost involved. 
Um, right now, leveraging digital channels, you are, reach, you are reaching um, your customer on a channel that it is all they have right now, right? So, um, there's none of us who aren't on our phones almost throughout the entire day because um, not just for phone, for um, work as well, for business, for the relevant messages that, that we know will come in through. There is no, there's very lim limited physical interaction right now. So everybody is on, on digital right now. So now is the best time to leverage those digital channels. Um, and it's not going to in incur any um, additional cost beyond whatever the base cost of, of that digital channel is. Um, at, the, at its very core, right, uh, the disruption digital has brought already sheds off um, fixed costs um, that have to do with rent, that have to do with equipment, that have to do with um, um, even the number of people you probably currently use as um, field operatives to, 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 to run your sales. Um, digital is going to disrupt all of that. It already is and it's going to continue. Um, so already by definition, switching from traditional to digital will automatically save um, your, um, in, your spend on infrastructure costs. Thanks, Dotsu. Um, yeah, so I, I think infrastructure is a very broad uh, term. Um, I just get that feeling that after this pandemic, a, a number of businesses are going to rethink um, how they operate. So for example, some businesses will ask themselves, why, why do I have an office space for 200 people uh, when I can just get a smaller space, um, pay lesser in rent, and get about half of my staff to work from home? Um, so I think in addition to what Dotson has said, we are going to see uh, businesses leverage digital more strongly um, for marketing and even for areas outside of marketing that are more into uh, business operations. Um, thank you for that answer, Dotun. The next question goes um, is from Olubenga Oguntade. Um, and the question goes to us, hi guys, this is a fantastic presentation at this trying time, thank you. When businesses will be transiting from physical interaction to online slash digital interactions. Will this recording be shared with the attendees? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, we can, we can make some arrangements for that. Um, uh, if you registered for the session, we, we will likely send you a link where you can um, listen to the recording after this um, session. The next question is from Mma. Um, for offline sales oriented businesses, do you think they should keep spending in this period with the goal of driving top of mind awareness, especially as they are not making any sales? This is, this is very, a very interesting question. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, I would say, um, and the, the advice to companies during this period is to um, really prioritize their expenses. Um, the changes that we're seeing, um, I don't think most businesses realize the impact that this disruption is going to make. Um, but you, we can already hear information and news around, around layoffs and all whatnot. Um, with the recession, the natural response by consumers is to start holding cash and start increasing savings, right? Uh, that's what the people naturally do in, an, in a recession, which means that consumption and spending is going to reduce significantly. Um, so for most businesses, um, you want to prioritize uh, the survival of your business. You want to ensure that you cut costs where possible. Um, perhaps you freeze non-essential -ex um, expenses and you only implement marketing that drives ROI, post that drives positive ROI for you at this moment. So that means that as a sales or an offline sales company, if whatever marketing activities you have going on is not driving positive ROI for you in this moment, then you want to freeze that expense only because we don't know how long this lockdown is going to last. Nigeria, for instance, today is the 14th day, I think, of the lockdown. And we don't really have an information on, you know, if it's going to end or if it's going to get extended. If China is anything to go by since they have the first outbreak, uh, we can see that they opened up places and then they closed it back and, you know, there were reinfections and all whatnot. Um, there are projections that schools in New York and the U.S. might remain closed for the rest of the year, right? So we can see, we can draw inferences from all of these other countries to um, decide uh, um, and project what might happen in Nigeria. 
Um, for most companies, you want to ensure that you maintain a strong cash um, pipeline um, during this period um, because most companies are going to struggle. Some are going to fail. Um, for those that are able to survive, it's actually an opportunity for them to either acquire um, these businesses or acquire customers as a, as a relatively cheaper um, cost. Um, but if anything, businesses have to be very um, focused on managing their expenses, managing their cash outflow, and ensuring that whatever activities they do in this period is increasing their cash balances. Thanks for that response, um, Ayode. We have a second question from Omotola Shodade. It goes, um, how best can businesses leverage on Instagram this period? I'll leave it to you. Guys. <laughs> I can tell you how best to turn on search and YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so I think um, you would already see um, lots of business, especially SMEs, um, leveraging Instagram. Um, larger enterprises are also trying to showcase the corporate social responsibilities they are taking on right now, they are donations for the COVID-19 relief fund, ETC. Now, when it comes to driving direct, direct sales, um, um, how can you leverage this, this Instagram for this period? Um, I, I'd say same as before, if you're already, um, 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 if Instagram was already one of the channels used for marketing, um, I think same as before, um, nothing has changed except even more uh, room for more content. So when you look at, um, there was a question earlier that talked about, um, one, one of the ones um, I data tackled that talked about, um, will there be, um, what, what they call it, will there be some sort of digital saturation? I think that um, for people to adapt digital channels, is driven by content. Um, I already just told us about the search that YouTube has seen in this period, and that's just because of access to content, right? Um, everything that drives digital has been driven by, by content since day one. Um, look at the Netflixes and codes. Because of the kind of content they were able to aggregate, and um, also giving, uh, putting the power in the customer's hands to say, okay, you don't have to go to the record store while they do it to see to see. You can do that directly. It's the same thing that. Uh, businesses can leverage on social media and basically every other uh, uh, digital channel right now. Um, the kind of content you generate, social media has given the best opportunity to, to um, drive content that uh, sticks in people's minds. Tundi mentioned earlier that challenges like um, Don't Rush, Bob Daddy, ETC, we've not seen um, a surge like we saw when we had the, the mannequin challenge a couple of years back, for example. Every brand jumped on the mannequin challenge, right? From large enterprises to small businesses to individuals, of course, um, to those videographers online. So, um, right now, we've not seen a lot of that for a number of these challenges. Um, one, one thing I usually like to advise businesses to do as well is um, rather than just jump on um, some of the trends that you've seen, um, there's, that, then there's also leading the industry by creating a trend at this point. Imagine creating a challenge and engaging people and um, having your business name tied to that challenge, right? Um, it helps you build the kind of community you're looking for. It helps you build um, the kind of loyalty you're looking for from uh, customers. So I think the power of your content right now, I think uh, you need to pay attention to the power of the kind of content you are pushing out. Um, to leverage digital channels, including Instagram, this period. Okay, um, thanks. Okay. okay, you want to add something, Ayade? Yeah, just to add from our, our own point of view on, on search and on YouTube, uh, you know, this period, there's so many interesting data points that are coming, and we're still trying to organize them and present them in a way that's useful for brands and businesses. One of the things that we're finding, for instance, that there's a huge spike um, in search interest around boredom, for instance, and what to do, right? So people are looking for activities and things to fill their time. Um, uh, you're finding people are actually searching for things like puzzles and games and coloring books and all of that actually increasing. Uh, you need to remember that um, for the parents, they also are stuck with their kids. Um, the, the, the married ones are stuck with their spouse, quote and unquote. 
Uh, and so people are trying to find stuff to fill that time, right? Which gives an opportunity for brands to step into that space and be helpful. Uh, you're finding also trends around everything that can be digitized is being digitized, right? So um, for instance, gym and workouts online is becoming a thing. Uh, you're having people having, uh, you know, singing sessions, dancing sessions, um, all of these things happen. Um, for the religious folks, you know, the churches and the mosque and all of that stuff is going online. Uh, interestingly, uh, we're finding that actually therapy and counseling is actually also increasing uh, because people, you know, are, are going sort of like going crazy in a sense um, and looking for other people to talk to. Um, you have trends around people having more time to organize their space um, and, you know, sh um, take over their closets and their house, um, clean up their workspaces. Um, I think earlier on, we had the trend around, you know, posting what your workspace looks like um, and, and all of that. Um, so, you know, um, alone together is also a thing, right? So people are trying to connect with other people um, and looking for ideas. Um, I'm sure you've heard about how um, the app House Party has, you know, had a very significant increase in number of users, um, you know, so all of these trends, um, if, again, even on the CSR side of things, people are trying to donate, they're trying to volunteer their time, they're trying to reach out to their community and people who don't have as much um, as others um, to give back to them ETC, right? So there are a lot of, of opportunities during this period. Um, I think brands just need to listen more closely. Um, they need to be more human. They need to feel the pulses of their consumers. You know what? Reach out to your customer and ask for ideas of what to do to help them during this period, right? There's nothing better than talking to your users and your customers and, you know, addressing or, or doing exactly um, some of what they say, right? Especially in this season, you'd find that you'd get, you know, consumers might have very brilliant ideas for you to implement during this season. So um, I think there's an abundance of things for brands to do during this season. They just need to listen, um, they need to dial up their empathy, and they need, to be they need to try to be very helpful during this season. Thanks, Ayode. Um, next question is from Oluwada Milare, right? Um, and I guess he works with the power sector because his question is related to that sector. And the question goes first, how can the power sector, um, in, in this case, the discos, um, how can they leverage on digitization as what will become a norm after this pandemic? He then puts, can you note that we have e-channels for bill payments already, but not all customers are tech savvy or internet oriented? So I guess this is a, a problem as related to customer education. Um, Dotson? Yes, yes, um, that's exactly what it is. Um, I mean, in this period, if you, if you really want to reap any of the benefits of the post-COVID, of life after COVID-19, you need to start now. Um, one thing I've not seen from the discos is um, outreach to, to their customers. The discos are definitely one, um, one business that know every single customer. Um, even down to their houses. When they want to trouble people for light, it is, they, they can reach every single house, right? So looking at all of that, um, if you really want to uh, leverage this current digitization at scale, of course, we're not, the discos, um, even though they know everybody's address, they can't actively walk to every single uh, address to try to convince people to jump on the uh, e-channels that the, the, the currently have. But what needs to be done is, like Tindy mentioned, customer education. Right now, there are a lot of people that don't know the effectiveness of those e-channels. One thing I know about e-channels are this. Once you put a customer uh, on a certain level of convenience when it comes to e-channels, the customer hardly ever goes back and the customer becomes a, an ambassador, basically an advocate for that channel. Um, think of when the, 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 the bank started and GT led with Star 737. And many people never went back to, to how, they current, how they previously um, um, carried out transactions with the bank. So if you really want to reap the benefits now, right? Benefits cannot be reaped after the pandemic is over. The benefits have to be reaped now. Right now is the time to start um, actively marketing, right? Sometimes we tend to forget that the discos have also been privatized and they are a revenue generating uh, organization as well. So um, you definitely want to uh, um, improve on 
the marketing stance you currently have in the power sector, right? To use this uh, uh, digital channels, um, SMS, USSD, the web channels, etc., to educate the populace on on the, the convenience of the e-channels and of course why it is relevant for this period. Um, we're telling people to work, stay at home. We're telling people don't touch surfaces, etc., stay safe. Um, Avoid cashless payments, avoid having to go to the Nepal office, avoid having to do um, the things you currently do, right? Um, right now, I know that the, power, the, uh, the, the, the discourse can separate those who um, are using the channels from those who aren't using the channels. So that's a very easy way of segmenting who needs to hear this communication. And you need to start communicating with them digitally to give them the right orientation um, that will see you reaping this benefit long after the pandemic is over. Uh, just to add real quickly, uh, I think the best thing you can do is give people power. No, but I'm joking. Um, of course. course. <laughs> I think um, in this moment, uh, helpfulness should be the thing, right? So how can we be helpful? Um, perhaps educate people on how to conserve power, how to manage their power, how to um, ensure um, electric or power safety within their homes. Um, perhaps educate people on, you know, power, uh, you know, even other, other um, um, sectors that are not necessarily, you know, power specific, uh, but things like how to manage, um, you know, perhaps your electronics, your devices, safety precautions. I think there's a, there's a, there's a lot of areas that power companies can explore, um, but just, you know, have the theme and the focus of being helpful during this season can, can really be a good um, guide for you. Thank you so much, guys. Um, next question is from an anonymous attendee. Um, but he doesn't want to tell us his name, his or her name. Um, so the question is, how will real estate and savings platforms stay afloat using digital? So how can real estate and savings platforms stay afloat using digital? Who wants to take a stab at that? How can loan and... Um... Real, real estate. Real, oh. The person says real estate and savings platforms. I'm trying to think of the relationship, but that, that's how the person wrote it here. I think savings is, is probably um, easier um, only because um, on, in the short time, you probably have more people liquidating their savings just so they have cash balances or a cash at hand to meet um, short-term needs. Um, in the mid to long term, you'd have people actually increase savings. Um, only because uh, the economic downturn would force people to save more. Um, so, um, you know, as, as a savings company, um, consumers will probably be weighing their options now, and now is the right time to step in and influence, influence them, right? So you probably want to educate them on, you know, how to balance between having um, cash to meet their short-term needs and um, savings for their long-term well-being. Um, I think uh, you know a lot of education can be done done during this period. Um, for real estate companies, um, I think because there would be a general increase in online um, um, behavior and online um, participation during this period, um, it helps to come online and just feel the pulses of people with regards to real estate um, uh, and purchasing properties and land and all of that. Um, perhaps the, we know at least from the last financial crisis. The real estate was one of the sectors that got really badly hit um, by the crisis. Um, so, you know, while all crises are different, um, sometimes they have some um, similarities. Um, so, you know, I think this is the period where you want to start offering all the deals and the offers and, you know, all the things that you probably had planned for later in the year. Um, you know, probably you want to shift it upwards and just, you know, really capitalize on on, on, on the crisis that is going on. Again, not in a negative way, but more in a positive way. Uh, you know, you can come about it from the point of view of people protecting their, you know, their, their wealth or their, 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 their cash from the possible currency um, deterioration, devaluation, ETC. Um, so I think uh, real estate companies would need to be very strategic only because these are gonna be very tricky times for them, um, but they can approach it from the, from the point of view of helping people protect their, their wealth, their money, um, you know, come, you can position it as some kind of security and safety um, for the crisis and for the currency 
um, devaluation and, and all of that. Thank you so much, um, Ayode. Um, okay. Um, just to quickly add, um, also on the on the saving side of things, um, there are um, certain initiatives that I've seen a number of uh, companies outside of our market anyway um, take up. Right. So on the saving side of things, you see people currently, and when I say outside of our market, I'm, I'm speaking of Nigeria specifically. Um, in other African markets, you've seen um, um, and other oil producing states uh, globally as well. You, you've seen people trying to offer savings plans that help mitigate against the drop of their currency against the dollar. Um, we know how bad the Naira to dollar exchange rate is getting every day. So there are definitely savings options that one can put forward to say, um, save in USD, right, to protect yourself from um, the economic downturn that is currently affecting the Naira. Um, and and, and um, other kinds of initiatives like that. Um, on the real estate side, I agree totally with what I have said. Um, real estate is one industry that actually takes the heat when there's an economic downturn. But I also think that it's a room to be as innovative as possible. Now, when we say real estate, there are several different um, ways of going about offering value as a real estate company. Um, we know what the usual uh, suspect is that comes to our mind when, when we talk about real estate, we think about oh, buying or renting houses, etc. Now, when we, we talk about, we're talking about workspaces as well and how this work from home situation will be disrupted um, uh, almost permanently, possibly after the pandemic. We're talking about um, people cutting down infrastructure costs on, uh, on, on office expenses, fixed costs on light bills, etc. Um, real estate can also be disruptive there, right? We also we already know about uh, companies like CC Hall, Brock Station, ETC that provide um, shared working spaces. Shared working spaces might be um, um, one thing that will be very relevant post COVID nineteen. When brands start thinking of, um, do I even really need this office space for this many people? You can take on a smaller space, and if for any reason people need to use an office setting, you can leverage those um, co working spaces. Right, so real estate has to um, is an industry that has to diversify its portfolio right now, its product portfolio right now. You know, um, using things as they were before is not going to work anymore. So you also need to think in terms of it, the times we found ourselves in, um, the kind of innovation you're able to drive with uh, using this example I just made, using other examples around um, um, pay instrumentally, right for um, uh, uh, um, your access to XYZ property. Um, all those kind of offers, all those kind of promos right now, I think will take the cake. We already, I, I've already seen a number of businesses also um, leveraging this period to say, okay, beyond this pandemic, this is how we can help you with um, your rent. Um, take up this offer and get free rent for a year. It's to see, we've, we've seen a number of businesses already doing that. Um, um, some of us have banks that are ready to send us those, kind of, those kinds of messages. So I think the real estate industry has to diversify its portfolio so it doesn't fall victim of um, past pandemics or economic downturns, which we have taken learnings from by now. Okay, thank you, Dr. Um, for sake of time, I would like us to wrap up in the next um, five minutes at best. Um, so I'm just going to read out one more question from the Q&A section and then i'm going to ask the bonus question for both panelists and then we'll call it a day um so the next question and the last question from the attendees for today is from habib or Tola, and it says how can entertainers especially comedians who hold shows annually leverage on digital media to hold their shows who wants to take a stab at this um i can so um, I would assume that these comedians are already on digital platforms. If not, you better get in there ASAP. Um, we started seeing creative ways that um, some of these guys are um, coming online and trying to monetize their, their skills. Uh, I think it was Davido some days ago that said that now we know the true musicians that have savings <laughs> because there might not be any shows till December or, or something. So um, more people are online, like I said, over 20 million plus people are on YouTube now. 
I don't know how many on Instagram and all of these other platforms. So take your skills and your expertise and, and your entertainment online and, and monetize and have people pay for it. Um, there's, there's these guys uh, that do, I think they're a live band. So like um, some days ago, they actually had a live stream and they had um, their account numbers right there on the screen, right? So you know how um, if you attend a live band, you have these guys performing and um, if you give them money or you spray them, they'll call your name and all of that. These guys were actually doing it online and they had a live band um, on live stream and they had the account number there. And once you did a transfer to that account, they'll call your name live, you know, whatever. Uh, and they did this for hours and, you know, several days, right? Um, I think now is the time. Um, comedians are some of the cr most creative people. So take that creativity online, right? And use these channels uh, where you have a lot of people now um, and try to monetize your skills and expertise. If you don't have a YouTube channel, now is the time to create a YouTube channel um, because you have a lot of people on YouTube, right? Also take advantage of other um, video streaming platforms out there. Um, ensure that you are present. Um, you know, things like podcasting has also seen a big increase. And while it might not be necessarily directly relevant for comedians, it's an op opportunity for, you know, other entertainers and people who create content to also explore. Um, if you don't have a blog, create one. There's a lot of free platforms of creating blogs and sites. You know, brand yourself. Um, I think everybody, especially the entertainers, um, would probably uh, need to leverage digital media platforms more than ever before because you have more people coming online, people looking to be distracted, people looking for things to keep them hopeful, to fill their time, to help them stay connected, help them maintain their sanity. Um, and, you know, entertainers and comedians um, can come in and feel the need. I, I like this guy, um, Trevor Noah. Uh, you know, he's almost more reliable than news sources, or he breaks down um, the most complex um, information, especially with what's happening with the COVID-19 and all of that stuff in a very nice, simple way, right? So uh, while you can, be calm, you can be funny, you can explore other ways to still, you know, you know monetize and show your skills and your expertise. Um, so yeah, the easiest, lowest hanging fruit is get on digital media platforms, start money, um, building your audiences, um, look for the, um, the best practices on YouTube. Uh, we have the creator library. Um, just go or Google YouTube creator library or YouTube creator studio um, and, and you'll see a wealth of information that can help you learn how to use these platforms um, to start monetizing your skills and building your audiences. Okay, thanks, Ayode. Um, for sake of time, I won't be able to take any more questions from the attendees. I'm so sorry. I apologize for that. Um, the last question is the bonus question, um, which is question seven on the slides. Um, I would like both panelists to take a stab at the question. Um, and the question goes first, how can your company, so we have um, a panelist from Google, Ayode works with Google, Dotson works with Tarragon. Um, how can your respective companies help businesses who are how can your respective companies help businesses who are looking to reach customers during COVID-19? Um, do, you, do you guys have a special marketing uh, program or a plan in place to help uh, these businesses, SMEs, insurance businesses, people in the, in the arts and uh, sciences world? Do you have a, a special kind of marketing program or package to help them thrive on digital this period? Um, yeah, I can go first. Um, so Google is doing several things, uh, as you might be aware of, um, uh, with regards to the crisis that is going on and helping people. One of the things that we're doing is helping people find useful information on the internet. Um, this season, it's easy to be exposed to um, false news and false information. Um, and, you know, for instance, um, Google is not letting advertisers um, advertise anything that has to do with the coronavirus and COVID-19 only because, you know, it's an easy target for false news. Um, however, government agencies are able to um, certify and widely said government agencies can, you know, share content and monetize content on YouTube that has to do with coronavirus. Um, so helping people find this information is one of the things that we're doing and protecting people from misinformation. Um, we're enabling productivity for, for businesses and schools globally. So if you use Google Suite, uh, which is our productivity tool, um, you know, Google Drive, email, slides, sheets, forms, etc. Um, we've released the most advanced um, G Suite features to everybody. So that means that you can have meetings with 100 plus 100 people, um, live stream with even more. You can record. 
I know really exciting features are coming. Um, unfortunately, I can't disclose, uh, but that's, that's one thing we're doing. We have um, relief materials for government agencies up to $25 million um, donated through the World Health Organization. Um, health and science research, I'm sure you heard over the weekend about our collaboration with Apple. Um, for businesses um, and marketing in, in particular, um, Google is actually giving out $340 million in ad grants to businesses, to SMBs globally, right? Um, the qualification for that is that the ad credits will be given to small and medium-sized businesses who have advertised directly with Google or through a partner around the world and have an account, an active account since the beginning of 2019, right? So these SMBs who meet this qualification will see a credit notification in their Google Ads account in the, ne in the next month. Um, and basically, they'll get um, free ad um, credits that they can use to run advertising for their businesses. So this is one of several things that Google is doing. Um, and you can just go to Google search and, you know, Google, um, you know, what Google is doing to support businesses and individuals during this COVID-19 um, season. And specifically for the ad grants, um, you can Google COVID-19 Google COVID grants for SMBs and you can get more information about that. Thanks, Ayode. Dotson? All right, thanks, Tunde. Um, for us, how how Atara and how we're currently helping uh, businesses um, that are affected the most by this is using our customer data platform, right? Uh, our customer data platform, first of all, helps um, identify um, each business's consumers across all possible channels. Um, so, for businesses who have a website, for businesses already running marketing um, via um, email, um, uh, web ads, um, possibly even SMS. We help augment this by first giving a 360 view of, of the customer. And, and that's how um, we can monitor uh, 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 the customer across this period. Um, and uh, of course, why are we monitoring the customer? Um, we're trying to get as many actionable insights for the businesses to give uh, as many relevant recommendations as possible. Um, of course, we are partners with, with uh, Google when it comes to reaching your customers as well. Um, some of the platforms, some of the marketing platforms connected to our customer data platform um, include the web platform, right, which is a programmatic DSP uh, through which you can also reach Google users um, in their millions. Um, so we provide that web, uh, web uh, communication at scale. Um, we also have the SMS and USSD channels powered by um, um, the customer data platform as well, which helps you achieve hyper-targeting per age, sex, location, all those demographics. And um, most interestingly, spending power, which is something that is important for um, businesses to track across their customers right now. You want to know who's currently, um, who currently has the power to spend with me, but isn't active on, uh, isn't actively giving me sales. Um, also, you want to be able to personalize your communication at scale, and we have provisions for that on, on these channels that I've mentioned. Um, you want to, um, uh, so that, that's, that's hyper-targeting, cross-channel communication across SMS, USSD, and the web, um, personalization across each of these channels as well. Um, and of course, we know that migration is going to be a big deal for a lot of businesses this period. I said that um, first thing you are competing with is the essentials that every customer um, wants to uh, have provided to them first. And the next thing you are competing with is, of course, your, your usual competitors. Now you want to, more than ever, feel the pulse of each of your customers understand their preferences, understand how they are getting um, um, what you are offering from, from wherever they are getting it, if they are not currently getting it from you. Um, so we also have the smart survey solution um, or the eye survey solution, which is uh, an extension of the customer data platform as well. Um, this also provides um, cross-channel reach. Um, the service can be run through SMS, USSD, and web. Now, what's different between this and regular service is um, right now, there is no time um, to be waiting for responses to get back, um, then analyze those responses, 
and derive actionable insights which you can use to serve the customer better. Um, what you need now is real-time insights, real-time behavioral data at scale. That's something that this survey engine provides. Um, it's also, it also gives you um, the, the um, uh, 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 a scheduling feature um, such that you can schedule this service according to the best response times seen um, on each of the um, audiences that you are pushing the service to. Um, based on their previous surveys, based on previous campaigns, we're able to measure their response rates and um, schedule your surveys according to those, the, the, the times where they give the best response rates, the times of day, the days of week. And um, most importantly, um, there is um, an artificial intelligence and machine learning arm that goes into this to take the behavioral uh, data points that we're, we're able to aggregate from these surveys and help you predict your customers' actions better, help you predict the best time and the ch uh, channel to engage them. Um, so, I mean, we spoke about um, um, availability online or offline for each of these customers. You want to know exactly when a customer is offline and reach them through offline channels. You want to know when exactly a customer is online and reach them through that channel instead. Also for some of the businesses that um, can easily become winners in this period, um, there is um, an auto top-up service that we also provide um, for, uh, think of the fintechs, the banks, the telcos, anybody that can provide uh, their customers with um, airtime and data in this period, right? We have a, um, an engine that powers that as well, that helps you automate that. You know, previously I talked about how relevance is going to put uh, businesses in the pole position to be the winner of life after COVID-19, right? So um, automation, how well we can automate the processes through which our customers access our services is very relevant here. So that's what Auto Top Up has come to tackle. So basically what it helps do is um, predict and meet customers' airtime needs. Um, when a customer is running out of airtime, um, we're able to push a data signal that helps them um, automate the top up of their credit or their data. Um, it in turn, of course, increases the monthly revenues for, from airtime, from, from the business, whatever business is, 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 will be dishing this out, whether you're a FinTech, whether you're a bank, whether you're uh, a, um, um, a service provider in this industry. Um, and it also guarantees you repeat transactions. That's one thing that automation will always do. It guarantees repeat transactions because the convenience is there. I know how many payments I've automated to this that I still haven't changed them. I, don't, I really don't see any reason why I'll change them. The only ones I change are the ones I didn't intend to automate in the first place, like LinkedIn Premium, and we know the usual suspects of those things that chop our money. But we know the essentials. We know how essential communication is in this period. We know how essential internet uh, um, services in this period, right? So automating people's access to that um, is a sure win. So um, on the customer data platform, uh, to summarize all of this, um, there is hyper-targeting per demographics, per spending power, there's cross-channel communication, there's personalization at scale, there is uh, uh, predictions from uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's um, the survey engine which will help you gather as many behavioral insights uh, as possible to prevent customer migration away from your business. And of course, to top it off with automation on uh, the airtime and data top up side. Um, there are a, a number of other um, um, things that we have in place to help businesses in this period. Um, us being a data and marketing technology company as well is we look at the pulse of the economy and we try to iterate uh, for the businesses we support as well. So even as these weeks go by, with each new insights we gather, we would of course, uh, uh, presents even smarter ways of going about um, reaching your customers and um, uh, maintaining whatever cost base you have in mind while doing that. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dotun. Thanks, Ayode. Um, I appreciate you guys. Um, I also appreciate the attendees for making out time to join um, our first webinar. Um, I would like to call on Nita to give us uh, the closing remarks for today's session. Nita.
Nita, are you there? Okay, um, it seems we can't hear her, so I'm just going to give the closing remarks myself. Um, so thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Um, this is the first in what we hope to be um, a series, a continuing series, where we'll talk about the impact of businesses during this period. Um, even after this period, we also hope to continue this webinars to continue to educate ourselves essentially on how we can um, leverage digital, how we can leverage um, the new um, um, channels available to us as businesses to ride um, this wave um, through successfully. Um, once again, I see that we have a number of questions that have come in um, and are still coming in. I would like to apologize to the attendees that we will not be able to take those questions because of time. Um, we actually plan to end this session by 12, um, and this is almost one o'clock, so we are way past um, the initial allocated time. Um, but I, I would like for you guys to continue to keep tabs with our webinar sessions. Um, always sign up when you see those um, sessions so that you can um, maybe ask some of these questions in subsequent webinars that we have. So thank you so much, guys, um, once again. Um, thanks to our day. Thanks to um, Dotun for taking out time to answer some of these questions and share your knowledge and experience with us. Um, thanks to everyone. Um, see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Tunde, for having me. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thanks. <laughs>